Okay, today's the day. The 1938 V12 Coupe Lincoln Zephyr is finally ready to move on to its new owner. Uh, I'm so excited to hang out with JB a little bit, go for a little ride, take some pictures, and just kind of reflect a little bit on this project and wrap up our video series. So this is a great day, and I'm glad you're here to come along. Again, 1938 Lincoln Zephyr V12 Coupe with some tasteful modifications from original. Uh, why don't we get started and talk about kind of the project overall and what we've done to this car and uh, just kind of reflect a little bit on s s some of the things that have uh, happened along the way. Well, several years ago, uh, after looking for a long time for a suitable coupe, uh, 38 uh, precisely, uh, that was my favorite. Uh, 38s and 9s are very similar, but the 8 just happened to be a little bit more uh, audacious for me. And uh, so I, I, I focused on it. I didn't, wasn't able to find one, and then we, we did finally find one in Utah. It was in pretty, pretty tough shape, but the good news was it, did, it didn't have hardly any rust on it. Uh, so when we brought it back, uh, we were all excited about finally having a 38 coupe to do. And then we got a phone call from who turned out to be the, the actual owner and uh, seemed like a really decent guy. And we talked about the, the, the di different models, the convertibles, the coupes and that sort of thing. And then I probably made the mistake of saying I, I preferred the 38 ab ab above all of them, uh, the coupe specifically. And uh, he said, well, where would we get one? <laughs> I said, well, there's only about 30 feet away, so I guess that that's how the whole thing started. And by the time I realized I got it out of my mouth, I had, I'd given away my own car. But he seemed like a really good guy. He's proven to be incredibly patient, really good people to work for, and uh, kind of like-minded in terms of what we wanted to see happen and what we didn't want to see happen. Didn't want the car to be chopped up and turned into some hideous uh, caricature. So. We were kind of uh, figuring out how we could do some modernization without actually affecting the appearance of the car. And um, so we, we, what we decided was that it would keep the original V12 engine and, uh, and the radiator, and, um, the, but it needed a little bit more fuel, so we designed and built a 3-2 carburetor setup for it. Okay. Um, moving back from there, we... Uh, Decide. Can I back up a little second? Uh, where is this? Was this engine in the car? Uh, this this car was uh, the engine was with it, but it was not in good shape, so we had to completely go through it. So we commissioned Ed Smith, who's a 83 year old master engine builder who builds engines when he's in the mood <laughs> <laughs> for the right people at the, at the right moment. And yeah. if he's not, you just might as well forget about it. But he's. A, a wonderful guy, extraordinarily uh, well experienced. He built a lot of high-end race cars and that sort of thing. So he really is the kind of guy that we wanted to get. Um, V12s are, the parts are difficult sometimes to find. They're not as easy to build as a Cher an early Chevrolet or a Ford. So they present a unique problems. But Ed just shrugged his shoulders. He just didn't bother him a bit. So we got, uh, got Ed to build the motor took a considerable amount of time to find all the parts that we wanted and uh, but we did get it rebuilt and Ed, Ed is uh, credited with that and then we decided we needed uh, a little bit more carburation so we put three twos on it uh, we also decided that we wanted it to be an automatic car so that necessitated that we put uh, a suitable uh, transmission behind the V12 which leaves us very few options. The C6 Ford of the mid 60s is the most uh, appropriate choice. It is a very rugged transmission, but it's an early transmission. So instead of shifting smoothly like the stuff we're all accustomed to now, it has a bit of a, a jolt when it goes from gear to gear. So you got to get used to that a little bit. But that's part of its beauty is it's very rugged. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we can count on it for service for a lot, a lot of years. It's also easily rebuildable if that had to be had to be done. So How we hard is it to marry that to the engine? Well, the engine on the back of the V12 is the same as a flathead Ford. Okay. So that's how we picked up on that cue. 
And uh, I don't know that a lot of people ever put a, a C6 behind a, a V12, but it, it certainly is a simple thing to do because the the bell housing is uh, accommodates that, and there are kits that you can buy to make the transition as between the uh, the, the C6 and the back of the V12 because it's very similar to a, okay. to a flathead Ford. Okay, so how did you work out the gear shifting mechanism? Well, I mean, being an automatic, um, of course, you have a completely different series of uh, rods and that sort of thing to shift the transmission. It's not like the the, the three-speed that came in the car. So you got a lot of things to modify, a lot of things to re-engineer there, and it, it can't look stupid. So um, we took a, a, a modern shifter for an automatic that looks like a, an early 30s three-speed. We modified it somewhat and, and made it look like we wanted it to, to look. I mean, the guys in our shop just take anything they want and do anything they want. It's just amazing. Uh, you just say, I, I, I don't want to look like that. And then you go back in the office and leave them alone, you know? Right. So it really, it looks very much like it could have been a period correct shifter, mm -hmm. uh, but it's shifting an automatic and not a, not a trans standard of transmission. Gotcha. Okay. And then further back, of course, when we do that, then of course we get rid of the, the system that connects the original V12 with the back of the car. Mm -hmm. So now we've got to go to a more modern, uh, typical drive shaft that, now mates to a, a Ford nine inch rear end. Another which, rugged choice. And that, yeah, we're always going for, for uh, you know, durable. Yeah. And uh, you know, you can build anything that, to last a couple of months, but we wanted something that will last as long as, as it needs to. And that nine inch Ford has, has been used in race cars for forever. And mm -hmm. they're just incredibly well made. They're simple and, uh, and pretty much bulletproof. So that was a good choice. Plus we got to pick the the gear ratio that we wanted for the car, because right. the gear ratios in these cars originally was really funky, uh, and it really didn't work in a modern world. So we we updated that to accommodate that. Uh, when we did that, of course, then we could put modern disc brakes on the back. Mm -hmm. Additionally, uh, we we modified the entire front end okay. to accept front disc brakes, which was. Uh, a very, very complicated process. The original car had mechanical brakes, right? It had mechanical brakes, and uh, so did its um, successor, but these are disc brakes. And so we wanted to go two steps rather than one. The 39s had had better brakes, but uh, they're still old and funky and very difficult to find parts for. So, you know, what, what you're looking for is, is durability and longevity. Uh, when this car changes hands and goes to the ultimate owner, then we want him to be able to go to a regular parts to supplier, a Napa or or a, a local parts department and just get parts for it. Uh, brake mm -hmm. shoes, uh, uh, or rather brake pads for the disc brakes are commonly available. Uh, the bearings are all standard bearings. So we get away from the, the stuff that was uniquely to this car when it was built because some of that stuff just isn't there anymore. So yeah, and those look, are practical things, and cosmetically, you can't tell the difference. Basically. Well, you can't really. I mean, that, that that's one of the secrets of building these cars is trying to, when you change all these things around, you change the height, you change the width, and uh, it's no mean feat to make all that work and have it look like it's correct. And uh, Mark Richler in our shop has been doing this for 40 years and build high-end uh, hot rods and customs and that sort of thing. So it was a natural thing for him. It still took a, a tremendous amount of work uh, and some experimentation, which uh, led to redos. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we got it, and we got the wheels tucked up in the front. We got the artillery wheels that we we, we coveted for this car, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and it also has its own its own artillery wheels, which are completely unique to this car. Wow! And let's talk about the wheel covers. Ooh. Well, that's, that's, that's where this car is really interesting. Because if you look at it from 20 feet away, you'd swear they were original Zephyr hubcaps. Mm -hmm. They were the optional rare Zephyr hubcaps. Okay. You don't even want to know what a set of those is worth. In these. You can buy a car cheaper. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> wow. They didn't make very many of them. They're very precious. And usually they're bent up. They require a lot of restoration. Mm -hmm. So we said, look, let's just, let's just take another direction. So we created these wheels and these wheel covers rather, and then we integrated the V12 inch uh, insignia, okay. custom to this car, mm -hmm. into those. 
It's very subtle, but uh, it should it should put a smile on it, on the owner's face. Hopefully. Wow. That's our that was our, our intention. It's got another it's got some other touches like a rear camera, that that sends a, a picture to the rear of a mirror in the cabin. Uh huh. So he can when he puts it in reverse he can look back just like in a modern car. Sure. These split windows in the back may look great, but they, you can't hardly see out of them. So yeah, they're very small. Very small, and and in 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 reality, you need to be able to see out the back. Yeah. And so that's why we did that. Let's talk about the interior. You made a, quite a few very tasteful changes, it seems. Yeah, it was it was a a, a process uh, of trying to figure out what uh, Bob Gregor would have done. I think that was my guiding light. Bob is the guy who designed the car originally. Was a masterful designer. He worked for Edsel Ford directly and under his direct supervision, mm -hmm. especially with this and especially with the Continental that he also designed. Those were two things that were near and dear to Edsel Ford's heart. And he actually drove the first prototype down to Florida and created a sensation. And that's why the Continental, that's why the Continental was actually born was because of all the interest in the car. Mm -hmm. And that was another Bob Gregor car. So he was a very, very talented uh, designer and uh, Edsel Ford called on him to do a lot of different kinds of things. But this is this is really is Mia Copa, if you ask me. And uh, uh, without a doubt, there's no bad angle on this car. Yeah. So we had to be really careful, especially when we did any kind any kind of modification. So we wanted the the seat. And if you look at a, a Continental that comes a couple of years later, you'll see that influence in the in the interior in this car. Okay. Yep. So we picked up on that, and then we took that and molded it and shaped it to the shape of this seat, covered it with uh, tan leather, which would be period correct. Uh, and it, very, it looks very much like it could have come in this car originally. Okay. And then we continued the wood grain theme that uh, was carried out in the garnish moldings and we took that to the next level. We did the front windshield frame and we also did the dash and the waterfall and right. all did it in the same color. So it had a sense of unity to it and it's, far and away one of the most attractive parts of this car. If you get it up in there and look at the craftsmanship and the, mm -hmm. the artistic ability it took to do it, it's amazing. Uh, Who do you uh, send send that out to to get the uh, wood graining done? <laughs> we send that out to the to, to our guy in the uh, wood graining department who is just, an, uh, Tony is his name, and he's just probably one of the most talented people I've ever met. Um, you can just simply give him something you describe to it what you want, and then you go back in the office, and you come back and say, "Why hasn't he started on?" It? He said, "Because he's already finished it." It's just, yeah, the guy is amazing. Um, you know, he's been. We worked together now for probably almost 25 years, close to 30 years. He kind of grew up in there in, in our shop, and uh, it's just an incredibly talented guy. He picked up on it. We gave him some really good equipment mm -hmm. and some good visions about how things are supposed to look. And let him take it from there, and he's mm -hmm. just a masterful job. Okay, I'm going to ask you now about the steering wheel that matches the outside paint color very beautifully. Yes, that's another uh, liberty we took. The original steering wheels were primarily kind of a yucky, dead banana yellow, which I which I wouldn't put on anything, much less mm -hmm. a steering wheel. And it's, it was very bright and out of place uh, on the Zephyrs, and so being a steering wheel company as well. We, uh, we had a, a, a ruby red steering wheel made, and then the inner core was polished, so you'd see some, some brilliance coming from the inner, in, inside of it, because now you can th see through the wheel. Right. And, and tr match that up with some other elements in the car and the mm -hmm. interior. Very good. Now, um, how did you, I mean, there, it's obvious there's a, an awful lot of tasteful, not too much, but chrome and trim of different types on this car. And right. it, just, it strikes me that there's probably quite a job in itself just finding the parts in the first place and then either restoring them, replating them or whatever. Tell me how that all went and happened. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 there's precious little of anything for these cars. Mm -hmm. And when you get to custom chrome that's unique to a coupe or a, or a convertible, it's even worse and more difficult. Right. So over the years, we've, you know, if I saw something for sale, I just closed my eyes and bought it. I didn't, mm -hmm. some of it I probably overpaid. And um, that's okay because nowadays, of course, they, they don't exist anymore. So the right. coupes and the convertible coupes had their very own trim in a lot of ways. 
So we were able to cherry pick through the things that we did have and, uh, and use it on this particular car because we weren't constrained by the normal problems you have like me being cheap. And, uh, but we used that as our guiding light. We didn't want to just spend money to spend money. Right. But in the case of, the, of for instance, the, uh, the rocker moldings, the ones that we found were so badly dented up and, and really not that well des designed in my estimation to begin with that we redesigned them and re had them remade. Okay. And uh, they're absolutely exactly what we want them to be. Uh, and I think that they are actually a little better, but the, you have to get, get up close to them to even see the difference. Yeah. Uh, they're wow. a lot more rugged. They're not 16th of an inch thick mm -hmm. like the original ones were. And that was part of their problem. You just touch something and they dent up. Yeah. And they run the length of the car. So they're right out there in harm's way. These are a quarter inch thick and mm. uh, well, much more rugged. Yeah. Uh, just little stuff like that. The, the rear mm -hmm. license plate was moved down to the bumper. Yep. Where, it, where God intended it. And mm -hmm. uh, back then they just wanted to see their license plate. Well, putting a, a license plate on the deck lid of one of these yeah. uh, would be like, uh, you know, insulting the Pope. So we just said, no, that can't do that. We're going to put it down there. And we've done that on a number of cars. This one has its own custom license plate, mm -hmm. which is uh, the car will live in New York. Okay. So we built a New York license plate with the script is correct. Okay. It's just translucent. And then when it he'll register that uh, 38 V12, hopefully, in the state of New York, and it'll be legal. Okay. I'm sure there's some police will ask him where he got that license plate. <laughs> All right. But as long as the letters and numbers are correct, then it, it's a correct license plate. Interesting. And we have the same thing on the Arizona cars and the California cars. That we yeah. One thing that I want to come back to is uh, you kind of kind of glazed over the fact you went from a single carburetor to three carburetors. Yeah. What's involved in working that out? Well, there's a lot to it. I mean, you're talking about flow dynamics, and if you don't have a, a grasp of that, you shouldn't be doing that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's pretty complicated. You're talking about a stream of air going through a carburetor, and in the case of a two-barrel, and a big long engine, it doesn't right. take a, a lot of imagination to figure out that the middle is getting a lot of fuel and the outside are being starved. And that's mm -hmm. part of the problem with a single two barrel. Okay. It's fine in, in the low end range where you're not going very fast. Mm -hmm. When you start to pick up speed, it becomes a real problem because now the, the, the cylinders on that are furthest away from a single carburetor yeah. are now you know gasping for fuel. Right. So it, it makes it a lot more difficult. And so when you put the two more carburetors on there, you have to also be mindful of the fact that you've introduced three times as much gasoline. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that very carefully and you have to yeah. do it with some, some understanding of, of fluid dynamics and aerodynamics mm -hmm. so that you don't just throw a lot of gas in there. Right. And one of the things we did is on an earlier episodes, we took it to uh, Chuck Speed Center where one of the best carburetor guys on the planet lives mm -hmm. and he fine tuned it and made it operate because you have a range of operation that a carburetor has to do. It doesn't just work at idle or off idle, it has to work right. off idle, on idle, mid range, and top in. So all those have, things have to be accommodated. You also have linkages that didn't exist. You have to, yeah, you didn't. You hadn't, didn't need multiple linkage because now you didn't. Right. But now we have three carburetors. Yeah. So we had to, you know, invent the linkage mm -hmm. specifically for that that setup, so that as the car accelerates, the gas comes on evenly and at the time that you really want it to. Right. Rather than flood the engine in early stages. Yeah. Um, that, that's a potential problem. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that they like two barrels, only two barrels, because they were, they were something they could count on. And they work fine uh, if you only want to go 35, 40 miles an hour. Right. Yeah. So, wow. But we, we, were, we were imagining something that had to operate at 50 or 60 miles an hour. Yeah, one other thing I wanted to touch on a little bit more also was the the suspension and the height. You, you mentioned you have to modify it, but yes. But how did you really work that out as far as uh, what and what did you have to change about it? Well, mercifully, um, Zephyr started out being relatively close to the ground relative to, uh, you know, in their day. In their day, thank yeah. you. And but that didn't that didn't take it down where we wanted it to be. We wanted to drop it a couple of inches. Mm -hmm. That couple of inches took a long time to, to get, because when you do that, you change the geometry of all the steering and all the, the equipment underneath the car. Mm -hmm. All of those A-arms and everything in there is now being treated differently. So 
we had to pretty much broom all of that and start over. And, uh, and, and at the same time, with an eye toward using modern components that were easily replaceable, that you could just go buy another one if you damaged it. So we had to keep that in mind. And we also wanted it to be functional. Now, this car is great until you hit a big bump, and then you, then you realize that there's something down there different. Yeah. But other than that, I mean, it, 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 because it's sitting down a little bit, it actually handles a little better. Mm -hmm. um, it, it looks exactly the way we want it to look, which is a tiny bit of rake. Um, it's called Stance, and Hot Rod Builders and Custom Builders mm -hmm. spend a lot of time working on that and, right. and trying to get it right. And it is not that easy. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about a lot of mechanical things have to be modified to, to lower the car a bit. And mm -hmm. then you see cars that are over lowered, right. which is really hideous. I mean, this is not a, you know, a, a car that really benefits from being slammed on the ground. Mm -hmm. It really wants to sit at a certain level. It doesn't want to be too high and it doesn't want to be too low. So a lot of time and a lot of uh, skill went into making that happen. All right. One last question, at least I think it's my last question, is I wanted to ask you about the color. Because you have several of these Zephyrs yes. you've done, yes. and they are similar, but I'm noticing yes. they're not exactly the same. No, they're not. And uh, I wonder what you, you know, how, what you feel about this color, how it compares, what you've learned about colors on these cars, if you could touch on that. Well, this is the third one we've done in this particular color, quote unquote. It's not really the same as the previous two. And what we did is we learned that in different light, that you had different effects. Okay. Um, all of these cars really, really want to be painted dark red. You know? Okay. Uh, I didn't make that rule up. The car did. And, and if you don't abide by it, then you're really missing a, a really a great opportunity because dark cars, uh, reds, blacks, blues, and that sort of thing, have a tendency to kind of disappear if you're not careful. So with the shadow lines on this car, we had to, we had to keep it light a little bit so you can mm -hmm. pick up on those beautiful lyrical kind of shadow lines that the car has. Right. Because if you put a dark color on it, it they just disappear. Right. So that had to be accounted for. So I think what we got on, on this car is that we got it right. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it has to work in sun and shade. Yep. And clearly this car does that. Yeah. Um, it had to be durable and it had to be taken into account that this car is all round and the bodywork on it is is mind-numbingly difficult uh, mm -hmm. to most cars have half the round surfaces <laughs> so many compound curves oh it's it? just endless <laughs> there are no flat spots right zero believe me i've looked <laughs> and so that means you're you're down to to you know doing your sanding with little tiny pieces of of stick sanding it's called and uh, because if you get the big least bit of a big piece it's going to cut a flat spot in. yeah right. that's your problem so having that body in that good a condition begs to be done in a dark color if mm -hmm. you could pull it off and you don't go too dark so all these mm -hmm. things play into it i guess you know it color is probably one of the most overlooked uh, parts of, of, the, of a build mm -hmm. and people will do i've seen some absolutely stunning work and then they put the wrong color on it yeah and you just wonder you just scratch your head and think was nobody ever teaching this guy anything yeah, wow. you know, and we can. Do, this is going to be actually a case in point because we're doing this interview in the shade. Yeah, and and the color comes off a little different. Yep. Than our Very much little so. photo shoot that was in the sun. Very much. So, so we'll be able to see right in this video the right. difference between yeah. how it gleams in the sun. Yes. And how it still looks cool but different in the yep. shade. And, and the, the reason that color. that happens is because it's got very fine flake in it. Okay. And that flake. Uh, is buried in a clear medium and then a clear medium is placed over it. Okay. So what you're seeing is a telescopic effect wow. of the sun actually heightening the, the brilliance of it by virtue of the fact that, that clear coat is now making that color pop a lot harder I see. than it would if the color was just simply a clear with, with flake in it. Right. Interesting. Okay. So it's, 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 it's being magnified, if you will. Uh -huh. And so when it goes into the light, it just it literally explodes yeah. if you do it right. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, JB, this is a, a really great, uh, a great day. It's really great to, yep. to see this thing wrapping up. I, I know the customer had to be patient. We Very went through patient. the uh, COVID years of all things to try yeah. to get this thing through the finish line. And yeah all the struggles that came about besides just the normal ones you yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. We attempted a lot of things in, on this car and, uh, and I, I think we pulled them off, uh, but it was at a cost. And uh, 
it, it took a, a fair amount of time and, and treasure to make these things happen. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so we're really, really tickled that we had the time to, to really get take it to the end of the line. Yeah. And uh, and then we've driven it around now and, and made it prove itself. Yeah. So we're really happy with it. Well, um, looks like a success for me anyway. Yeah. It looks great. But yeah. thanks a lot, JB. You bet. That's great.